Welcome to the new world of animal allies, the doctors, volunteers, pet owners and other surprising visitors who are out there making a difference. In the UK, animal doctor Justine Braun performs a routine but extremely delicate operation. While in Australia, an unusual animal helper is teaching self-defense to small marsupials. How to looks at the skills needed to groom a horse. And Animal World travels to Indonesia to track down a giant ancient man-eater. Vet Justine Braun is the brains behind Tom the Cat Place, a surgery with a difference. And Tom the Cat is a bit special too. Tom's been open for about a year and a half now, but it's the only all-cat veterinary surgery in London. The philosophy really behind it is to create an environment where cats can actually feel comfortable and relaxed. When cats come to the vet, there are a lot of foreign smells. So there'll be dog smells and dog sounds, and it can be quite uncomfortable and unsettling for them. Cats have a sixth sense, so they will pick up on a person or a vet who doesn't particularly like cats or is slightly afraid of them. And I think that's very important here, that they feel comfortable and that I feel comfortable working with cats. It makes it a lot easier. Well, I've always been a cat person. I've always been a cat lover. And I'm, I'm really enjoying this now. And I can concentrate on the cat as um, a species. And I'm, I'm specialising in feline medicine and surgery now. Justine has treated some pretty famous felines. I have seen the Spice Girls cats um, and the Spice Girl Mel, Mel B, Scary Spice. She has a, a Bengal cat and she called it Spot Spice. And it's a lovely cat. But Tom is not phased by the rich and famous. Tom is really a famous person in himself. He was rescued just under a year ago and he was in a very very bad state. At the moment he weighs just under six kilograms and when he came in he weighed just under two kilograms so you can imagine how thin he was. He underwent major surgery and he was on an intravenous strip for just under two, two weeks. Um, he was hospitalized, um, he was extremely ill. No one really thought that he was going to make it um, and I grew very attached to him. And slowly he came right and he just developed into the superstar that he is. Tom's also fascinated about what goes on here and he, he does feel that he is part of the, the Tom Capitalist team. He, he does participate. Today's visitors are Tabby and Blackie, two kittens that need to be spayed and neutered. Nurse Alison Loftus checks them in. I just need you to sign a consent form to give permission for their anaesthetic. Is that going to do any long-lasting family? No, they're young, young, healthy cats. Everything should be fine. Neutering is the term for the male cat's procedure. No, he should be fine. Male cats are given a quick general anaesthetic and then the testicles are removed. We normally check Spaying is the term for the female procedure. Spaying is more complicated than neutering, as the ovaries and uterus need to be completely removed. Give me a call, let me know what's going on. Unless you're a serious cat breeder, it's highly recommended that you have your cat sterilised. Ideally, the procedure should be carried out when the cats are around six months old. The first thing to do is to give the cats a pre-med injection. This relaxes the cats and prevents them from becoming unnecessarily stressed. We're giving a pre-med to, to relax the cat and also as a painkiller. It also lowers the amount of anaesthetic that we're going to be needing. Uh, it's going to take about a half an hour to kick in. While the pre-med takes effect, Justine scrubs up. It's essential that the operations take place in a totally sterile environment.
In Animal Doctors Part 2, we'll be back to see how Tabby and Blackie get on in theatre. Dr. Ian McLean is an animal behaviourist from the University of Western Australia. He has devoted the past seven years to helping marsupials defend themselves in the wild. Quokkas are small marsupials that live in Western Australia. They can now only be found on a couple of islands. They're not very street savvy. When faced with a predator, they simply sit and stare, not recognising the need to get out of there pronto. Ian is trying to change that. The quokkas are a model system. Quokkas are an endangered species on the mainland of Western Australia. But that's not the point. Quokkas are simply a system that's convenient for us to work with. This concept can be applied across almost any medium-sized marsupial. In fact, there's no particular reason why it can't be applied to any animal with reasonable amount of intelligence. Many marsupials have failed to deal with the threat of introduced predators brought across by early settlers. They have no inbuilt defence mechanism and are unable to see the dangers. Ian is attempting to teach them self-defence using a technique called behavioural modification. Behavioural modification is where you take the natural behaviours of the animal and you adjust them in some way to cope with some new problem that they are presented with. So in this case, these animals are accustomed to dealing with predators, but they don't know about foxes and they don't have appropriate responses. We're going to give them those responses. We were doing research on what we call the recognition problem and uh, we were using model predators, stuffed hawks, stuffed ferrets, stuffed cats, those sorts of things. Bella came along and became in a part of the family really. we started to realise that live predators were going to be an important contribution to this research program and so we thought, well, why not Bella? She looks like a fox, in a sense. Bella was nearly put down as a pup by a family that didn't want her. Luckily for her, she met Ian. Yeah, when we got her, she was a behavioural nightmare, there's no doubt. I and mean, the people who wanted to give her up had very good reasons. After three months of rigorous training, eliminating her worst traits, Bella was then given a pet rabbit and a chicken to teach her to be gentle with small animals. And that is when her career as an animal trainer took off. Her objective is to give them a fright and to link that fright to the shape of a fox. There's no doubt it works in a limited sense. These animals definitely become afraid of Bella. We've also asked them if they become afraid of a fox, and yes, they definitely become afraid of a fox. But there's another component to this notion. Does it work? If you take these animals and let them go, release them into the wild, will they be able to cope effectively with the foxes that live out there? We can't answer that question yet. But teaching marsupials to recognize danger is only the first step. They must now learn how to escape. This is called a runway test. The quokka is released in the specially designed pen with Bella close behind. The quokka must make its way to a hole in the fence at the end of the runway. Unfortunately, over the years that Bella's been training quokkas, she's started to grow old. She's become a lot slower and is generally quite bored with the whole prospect. So Ian has decided that it's time for Bella Mark II. Meet Kiri the Nova Scotian duck tolling retriever who bears a bit more of a resemblance to a fox. Kiri is being trained by Ian to follow in Bella's footsteps as the next marsupial trainer. If you uh, look at Bella, she looks rather like a fat dingo and of course fat dingoes are not the problem we're trying to deal with in Australia today. It's foxes that's the problem and so you choose a dog that looks like a fox and train her up to do Bella's job. So. Kiri is now Bella's apprentice and uh, we think she's going to be great. She has a lot of work ahead of her and big shoes to fill. Ultimately, the real test of the effectiveness of predator training is the improved survival of endangered marsupials in the wild. And with Bella and Kiri's help, Ian is well on the way to achieving that goal. After the break, Animal Allies returns with a close look at Indonesia's dragons and Dr. Justine begins a very delicate operation.
Keeping a horse is hard work. Not only must they be fed and exercised, they need to be groomed as well. Animal Allies Guide to Grooming a Horse Willow is a Welsh pony from the Blue Cross Equine Centre and horse expert Nicola Watson is going to give Willow her daily grooming. The first thing you need to do when you groom is to make sure that your horse is safely tied up. Use a quick release knot in case the horse panics and needs to be released in a hurry. Firstly I'm going to pick out Willow's feet. I'm just running my hand all the way down so she knows what I'm doing. This is important to remove stones from her feet. Check that they're all healthy. It's vital to pick the stones out of a horse's hooves daily because they can cause lameness. You can feel any heat or swelling in the foot. Once this is done, move on to brushing. I'm starting with a dandy brush. Introduce her to the brushes first. The dandy brush is a hard bristle brush and is used to remove the dirt from the coat. Once you've removed all the mud, and Willow isn't very muddy, you would then move on to the body brush. You always use the body brush in conjunction with a carry comb, which will remove the dust from the, from the brush. So after every stroke with the body brush, you clean it with the carry comb. Use the body brush to comb the horse's mane, as the dandy brush will break the hairs. Again, it's the same with the tail. You'd want to use the body brush on the tail as well so that you don't break the hairs. Once the coat and the hair are thoroughly brushed, clean the horse's eyes, nose, mouth and dog, and a happier, shinier horse is ready to hit the paddock. Want a quick recap? Check out this week's Animal Allies How To. Tie the horse using a quick release knot. Remove all debris from the horse's hooves. Brush the horse's coat, tail and mane thoroughly. Clean the horse's eyes, nose and dock using different sponges to prevent the spread of infection. Indonesia is made up of thousands of islands. Among them lies Komodo, a mountainous stretch of volcanic rock covered with palms, jungle and the largest lizard in the world, the Komodo dragon. An ancient species of reptile whose ancestors date back over a hundred million years, the Komodo dragon is one of the most frightening predators alive today. They grow up to 10 feet long and they're heavy too, especially after devouring a whole deer, a water buffalo or a live goat. Even a lash of its tongue can kill by infecting its prey with deadly bacteria. Around 5,000 dragons live on Komodo and the smaller surrounding islands. Some say they're the last living dinosaurs and have existed in the region for millions of years. Familiar with their unique biology is zoologist Ron Lilly. They say the dragons can smell a carcass, a rotting carcass from 15 kilometers away. Uh, you've got a mouthful of uh, curved, serrated teeth. Very unusual among the lizards. I mean, they're much more like shark's teeth. They can sprint for a short distance at 15 miles per hour, but when attacking prey, Komodo dragons are slow and precise. They are stealth predators, preferring to lie waiting for their next meal rather than chasing it down. It's hardly surprising then that tales of dragons attacking unsuspecting humans abound. There's a very famous one of a Swiss baron who was with a, with a tour group. He was left behind because he was tired. And when the tour group came back after their walk a couple of hours later, the baron was gone. The stories vary. There were, his spectacles and his shoe was all that was left of him. They never found the body. Though few stories are proven, it is a fact that Komodo dragons are more than capable of this kind of behavior. Locals on the islands fear and respect the huge reptile. According to legend, the first one was born to a local woman. Today, the lizard means business and villagers see dragons and dragon souvenirs as a source of income. 
For the dragons, survival means they will often eat their own babies, and sometimes if there's no food around, they'll eat each other. But whatever they eat, they leave few leftovers. Smaller Komodo dragons look almost appealing, but those who have met them say they, like their big brothers and sisters, smell of death. But this is their territory, and left alone, these giant lizards are sure to survive here for millions of years to come. Back at Tom the Cat Place, Dr Justine is ready to operate on Tabby and Blackie. Tabby's operation will be relatively straightforward, and he'll only require an intravenous anaesthetic. Go to sleep. The effect is immediate. Tabby's seven months old now. We normally new to male cats between seven and nine months. They reach puberty at about that stage, and they start marking their territory, which is very unpleasant at your home, because they spray their urine. They also develop a tendency to wander. We're basically removing the entire testicle. Male cats don't need any stitches. It's a very simple operation. And you'll see that it only takes a few minutes. This should calm him down so that he doesn't really have the tendency to, to wander. And he will also um, he will also not want to actually mark his territory. Have a good sleep. normally check on him, sort of keep an eye on him now for the next 10 minutes, just to make sure that he comes around okay. Blackie's operation is more complicated, and she'll be given gas and air, as well as an intravenous anaesthetic. This means she'll be under for longer. The procedure we're going to do is called a spay. And we're actually going to take out the cat's uterus and both its ovaries. Uh, Black is also seven months old, which is around the age where she will also reach puberty. And she can get pregnant from any time then. Spaying um, obviously prevents the cat from becoming pregnant, and so we are then preventing unwanted litters. It also later on in life prevents the cat from getting any uterine infections. Um, it decreases the incidence of breast cancer. It's very important because all, in fact, not only in London but all over the world, the stray cat population is just growing bigger and bigger. And stray cats do harbour all sorts of nasty viruses. I think luckily in, in London most pet owners understand the consequences of leaving cats unspayed and unmuted. Yeah, many, many years ago, the vets used to leave the ovaries of the animal inside um, to give it a continual supply, hormonal supply. Um, but that, they found, caused a lot, of, a lot of cancer in animals, so we stopped doing it that way. And there are very, very few complications to this operation. That's it, everything's out. Now what we're going to do is just close up the, the incisions that we've made. We use a um, suture material that will be absorbed um, within about six months time. When I'm about halfway through this wound, Alison turns off the anaesthetic um, so that by the time we've finished, the cat will have started to wake up a bit. But every, every animal is different and it's very individual. Some take a long time to wake up. Some are walking off the table as we <laughs> finish it. During the anaesthetic, the animal loses quite a lot of its own body heat. So it's very important to make sure that we keep them warm. And that's why we put her on a special heat pad that's warming her up. We're just waiting for her to wake up because she's intubated. We wait until they get their swallow reflex back and start to chew before we remove the tube. She's coming round a little bit. But 
and leave the tube in as long as possible because it's safer. Then you've got an airway if anything happens. As you can see, your brother's woken up and rearing to go. Hello. Any second now, I'll remove the tube because you can see that she's she's able to swallow and she's sort of rejecting it now. And we'll remove it and then she'll breathe normally herself. Just a few hours later and the patients have now recovered sufficiently to be allowed home. Okay guys, no you love it. Yeah, it went very well. Just a few things I need to tell you. Yeah, I think, guys, for tonight, you must just let them let them be really quiet, and let them recover from the anaesthetics that they've had, um, especially for Blackie because she's got some stitches. Right. So Good night, everybody. It's the end of another long day at Tom the Cat Place. In the next program, the new world of animal allies continues when animal helpers rescue some of Europe's most abused animals. And Animal World looks at the fascinating history behind one of London's greatest animal allies, the Blue Cross Animal Hospital. There are ways to make a difference.